I want to welcome Don Johnson here. And we all looked at John's work earlier, and we have Adrian here, who is uh, a longtime teacher of Don. Um, Adrian, have you seen Don? When was the last time you saw Don? Well, when she came and visited last semester. Oh, that's true. In your class, that I think true. we ran into each other. But I always love seeing Don because of Don's great energy. And also, Don sometimes teaches our high school class during the summer. Oh, that's right. Yeah, which is super awesome. And um, recently, I just saw what you were doing through Instagram with your new job. So <laughs> I'm super excited for you and I'm excited to hear more about that. Oh, so, yeah, for yeah. sure. The, um, so, Don, we're, go we're going to record this and we're going to archive it, if that's cool, with oh, you. Yeah. And then it'll be on YouTube. And, um, and it actually works out good and the student can revisit it and all of those things. And so, you know, a little bit of an introduction to Don. Don, uh, the very first time I ever taught anything ever, uh, Don was my student and she was very patient with me uh, in the graduate program. And the thing that I recall about Don is, you know, we all looked at her work last week and we all thought it was beautiful and it resonated with the students. It did not come easily. She was a very hard worker. And Adrian and I and everyone was coming at her with all this kind of input that would drive any student crazy. And Dawn was the person, she was the student that you almost had to say, you need to slow down here. You need to kind of, you know, think more rather than like do, because she was a very aggressive worker. But she truly like kind of, you know, took on the problems that her project was presenting and found a way to like make them her own. And as, as like a new teacher myself, it was fascinating to see. And I couldn't, it, it was just kind of this exciting experience of seeing a student break through. And uh, yeah, I don't know. How, uh, do you reflect on that time, Dawn? Or is, was that just the way you always work? Uh, no, yeah, definitely. Um... I got I got Sam a lot of the same critique in, in a lot of different classes, which was slow down. You don't need to take seven hundred photos. Um, relax, but I'm a very high energy person, and that's yeah. always how it had worked. Um, so getting that critique and and there was an absolute point where there was a shift from like really really good, not great, to like oh now I get it again, and like just being able to like slow down during that time because for me it was always like momentum momentum going but then actually get taking that and slowing down uh really ended up helping my work get to where it ended ended and needed to be that's neat that's um, neat no that's exciting things, uh was the you know i have it right here uh our dinosaur project where <laughs> we had dinosaurs in all of our uh works just for shits and giggles um and i got to keep all the dinosaurs after so they live in my plant yeah, Dawn was very excited by an assignment that everyone else thought was absurd and ridiculous, and she took it upon herself and made it her own. The, um, the, Dawn was definitely a hard worker. And the other thing I remember, and like, so Dawn, this is the senior project class. So it's undergraduate, and they all just put together a portfolio. And I do remember Dawn was very um, open about the challenges of the expectations for the MFA. You know, and I remember she really had a vision where she was like, I don't want to do a portfolio. I want to do a magazine. My stuff feels like a magazine. It lives in the spread of a magazine. And the, in the end, she did both. And really, I think to me, again, as a, as a new teacher, it was exciting to see both of those things. You know, like she put together a traditional portfolio, but then her real vision was to make this live as a published magazine that had spreads and that worked on spreads and was on glossy but thin paper and just felt like a magazine that you would pick up for free or something like that. And really, I thought that probably was the finest, you know, presentation of the work, you know. Yeah. So, you know, there was the idea of fighting for, you know, what the school tells you to do and fighting for your vision for something, you know, which is something I think all of you have had to kind of wrestle with this semester as well. So that's a little introduction to Dawn. And as we talked about last week, Dawn's work is one thing that's fascinating, but then the other aspect of it is, to me, what I've been fascinated by is seeing the trajectory of her career. And I can't even think, of how long have you been out now, Dawn? I graduated May of 18, so two years. 
oh, that's it? It feels like you've been working as a professional photographer in San Francisco for a decade or something. Yeah, I've, been, I've been a professional photographer here for five years. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, no, that makes more sense. The, um, no, that's real interesting. So, you know, uh, Dawn has great energy and she was a wonderful student, but I do, I'm really fascinated with the work she has done since she's left. Not the photos, but the, the jobs she's gotten for herself and the jobs that have disappeared and then the jobs that she did kind of finesse into herself. And to me, Dawn, and we'll get into your whole trajectory later, but it almost seems like what you're doing now seems like a real culmination of everything you've been dabbling with. You know, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. What is your title now? <laughs> um, so I work for a, uh, a small fashion startup called Original Stitch. Um, with kind of the startup culture, you get to wear a ton of hats. Uh, so I'm the lead photographer, I am the social media specialist, and I am the influencer marketing manager. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's very cool. So we'll get to like how you got yourself into that position but um, later. But I wanted to kind of start at the beginning. You know, we all liked your thesis project, and I thought the students might have some questions about that as well. Could you share that with us? And you can even just use your website and then... Um, I can totally figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with Zoom? Yes, um, cool. So uh, you have to uh, allow me to do that, to share my screen. Is that true? Yes, because you have disabled share screening or screen sharing, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Huh. I'm gonna make you a co-host. Let's see if that allows you to do that. Yeah, I'm now a co-host. Great, and now I can, awesome, cool. I will share my screen. Great, that makes it easy. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Awesome. So we will just go to Don Elizabeth photo. Cool. So uh, this is my website. It's fun, it's colorful. Um, and let me get to do, 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 do colors cool so yeah my thesis was the personalities of color which was a look at uh, color psychology through fashion um basically i took every color i researched it and um put it into a form almost like a character uh for each uh each color that's generally associated with so you know, you have red for passion and anger, orange is outgoing and reserved, yellow is cautious and nervous, but also bright and happy, green is envious, green for the army as well as the earth, uh, navy was uh, like secret agent-esque, like a little bit cold and reserved, blue for generally for sadness, light blue for, for airiness and, and freedom, uh, Lavender was, was girlish, uh, purple was royalty, and then this, these were my favorites, were hot pink, because that's my type of personality. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot of fun to get to do this, and, and there was this, you know, there, there was a dip in the middle. Purple was my least favorite one, because my God, that was so hard to style for. Um, where you, you see the, the transition between strong, weak, and then back to strong again. Now, when you say you researched the colors, do the colors really mean something in some universal way, or were you simply putting your own interpretation on them? So they generally have um, a universal kind of feeling. Like uh, a lot of food industries will do this to get you, uh, like McDonald's, yellow and red. It's like a feeling that kind of gets you hungry. Um, so I did a bunch of research as into what the colors um, generally meant universally, and then I put my own spin on it. Uh, creating these characters. Oh, that's interesting. So, some students in this in this class kind of work in this in this way. Can you tell us your what would like? Did you have a crew? Did you do it all by yourself? What? Uh, how did you come? Uh, like, what? What does it take to make one of these images? Um, so, at first, I tried to do it all by myself. Um, I even took a styling course because I was like, I don't want nobody's touching my my vision. This is mine. Um, stupid idea. You can't do it all on your own. Um, so what I ended up happening was I actually had a stylist reach out uh, at the beginning of my senior year and she was just like, I want to become a stylist. And I was like, great, let's go style. 
Um, so we, her and I uh, would go to H&M, Forever 21, Zara. We would buy all of the clothes and they have a 30 day return policy so long as all the tags are on and you have the receipts. Um, and she, I would give her my mood board, I would give her my vision and we would go shopping together. Um, I scouted the models basically on Instagram. Um, I, there wasn't as much of a um, foundation with the, uh, with the agencies when I was there. I know John Vanos worked really hard to like get that. So I scouted all of them uh, through friends or no or Instagram. Um, and then we would, I would reach out to hairstylists um, at salons and makeup artists. Um, I ended up working uh, with one stylist and then one makeup artist basically throughout the majority of these. We found that we were really good niche and we worked together uh, to create almost all of these. Oh, wow. So would you meet the models in person or like, I mean, a lot of times the students complain about models flaking, models not showing up, relationships yep. with stylists not being worked out. I mean, was it the same stylist for every shoot? Yep. Yeah. Um, she wasn't a student. She had just found me on Instagram. I was very lucky. She just found me on Instagram and was like, I want to be a stylist. I want to style for you. And I said, okay. Um, she worked at, uh, Old Navy and, um, Basically, she was like, I just want to, I just want to be creative. And I was like, great, let's just go be creative. There wasn't a, she didn't have her assignments and I had my assignments. It was, let's create something really beautiful together. Um, That's interesting. Now, would you say, was she, were you guys equals? Like, were you at equal points in your career, do you think, where you were trying to get something off the ground? Or was she more established than you? Or were you more established than her? She, she just wanted, she didn't like being like an administrative assistant. She wanted to become a stylist and she's now styling in New York. Um, oh, seriously? Yeah, this is our launch. She was just like, after, um, after I graduated, she's like, okay, I'm ready. And she went to New York. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, yeah, so oh, models. Yeah, um, working with agency models is definitely better um, because one, you know that they're professional um, and two, they tend not to flake as much. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it is what it is. It's going to happen. Um, you just kind of have to adapt and overcome and have backups and be like, hey, I'd like to uh, shoot you for this. I have a model in mind already, but in case something happens, would you be willing and able and ready on this date and time? Oh, um, really? How often did you call that understudy into play? Uh, blue, blue, this one right here. Um, she flaked and I was able to call her that night and I was like, my model flaked, can you be here? She's like, I can be there in an hour. Really? Wow. Yeah, and it, it turned out better than I could have ever anticipated with the other model. Like she was, this model was perfect and beautiful and um, really, really embodied the character I was going for. There is that idea in casting that sometimes you get your heart set on it going one way and then you kind of know what you're going to get then. And when you get thrown that curveball of like, oh no, you can't do it with that person. You need to do it with this person. Sometimes that unknown thing brings something new to it. That's like, you know, alive, different, unexpected. Um, purple, we had to shoot three different times because the models kept flaking. Uh, a model sent to her friend and the friend was six sizes bigger. So we couldn't use half of the clothes. Um, so it was, yeah, it's just, you, you just have to go with it and, and adapt, adapt and overcome. Uh, that's, that's a good philosophy. So now, um, I remember that there were, there was an emotion. I remember, you know, thinking back to your project and some of the feedback you were getting as a student was that the emotion that the model was trying to give you was not the appropriate emotion that maybe your research had said that this was supposed to be conveying. Yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah. So in the beginning, I really didn't have a concept. I was like, this is my concept. I want it to be monochromatic fashion. And they were like, cool, that's definitely not enough. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, so in the beginning, I knew that I, I wanted to like provoke the understanding of the color. And thankfully for the first several, it, it came like, it came just very naturally. But as like orange, I, I didn't do enough research beforehand. And so I had to backtrack trying to do that. Um, cause I had strong images, but I didn't have a narrative. I didn't have a story that went with them. Um, and that's something that you really, really have to have because there's only so far visuals will go. You have to have a thing to back them up. And what ended up happening was rather than just taking all these beautiful photos, I was being so much more intentional 
um, as I started shooting. I was like, okay, this is like, these are our adjectives. This is what we're going for. I want you to feel this. Um, so like, as we ended up going into something that was a little bit more emotional, the emotion was actually driving uh, the images rather than like, let's just take pretty photos uh, that are all monochromatic. No, that makes sense. No, and it's good that you brought up this picture. Like looking for a narrative in something that has no location, no props really, no, there, there's nothing there <laughs> except a person, clothing, and color. Um, where does that narrative come from? It comes from the, the reaction then that you get from the image. For this like, her, her mood, her pose, it's all about how, what she is then portraying. Because the, you're right, there is no context clues. So she has to be the context. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the acting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, that's what, it really became um, character building. There was a lot that went into like creating who this person was rather than just a model in clothes. And that was given an emotion. It was, who is this character now? What are they going through? Right. Right. And so as far as you, do you see that you were like a director, like a movie director who was trying to summon, summon like emotion out of someone or was it a collaborate, collaborative or how did you see it working out? It's crazy because when I had a lot of behind the scenes videos taken, like my stylist was like always shooting for me behind me. Um, I don't remember half the words I said. I don't ever remember like speaking when I get in front of a camera, my mouth just types, starts to go. Um, and I don't actually have any like conscious control over it. So it's a lot of, all right, this head up, head down. Okay, you're sad here. Now hold yourself, hold yourself tighter. Why are you holding yourself? Are you, are you angry? Are you sad? Think of that guy, that one guy, think of chicken nuggets. That's my favorite one to do is think of chicken nuggets, but don't show it on your face and the eyes light up. Um, so it's-, it's I hate chicken nuggets. Um, yeah, they're chicken nuggets and, and have your model do that, but do like, just think of them, and generally you'll get this like light, bright face. Nobody doesn't like chicken nuggets. <laughs> um, oh, that's interesting. The uh, how do you look at this project now? Do you look at it as like ah, oh, that's something I did in the past, or do you like what? What's your take on this now? You know, um, I've definitely uh, I love this project. Uh, there are so many things I would do different now. Uh, not having a studio and all of the equipment and all of the resources, like uh, you really, really, you know, miss having all the resources. Cause once you get out there, you don't have them. Yeah. Um, but I have, I have tried to continue um, doing that um, in different ways um, and moving and trying to elevate it now, knowing what I know, you know, having correct model choices, uh, really intense styling and intentional styling, but still working with the monochromatic things and then taking it out onto location. Oh, this stuff's real nice. I haven't seen this. Is yes. this working with the same stylist or is it? Um... Uh, no, this is a different stylist. This is a stylist that, that was at, at the Academy. Um, yeah, this model, she's, uh, she was my yellow model. Yeah. Because um, she's awesome, I can show you. This was her. Um, oh, right. Yeah, so I worked with her before and then I, she popped up on my Instagram with blue hair and I was like, we're doing this. She's like, okay. Oh, that's really neat. So, you know, let's pause as we're looking at this project here and because, you know, a lot of this conversation is we're going to be talking about Dawn's jobs and stuff, but as we're looking at this work, I think a lot of students, when we looked at this work last week, had questions about your project and how you go about things. And so let's pause here and open this up to the students um, does anyone have questions on just the kind of art of what she's been doing? And I know you do all have questions because we, we made you come up with them. So um, I will call on you if you don't volunteer. Let's start with Monica. Hi, uh, my name is Monica. Um, I was going through your website the other day and love the color series. I'm sort of doing something similar and it's just, it's beautiful. And I went to your about page and I saw that you were, um, you started your own business while pursuing, like while you were in the Academy of Art, like how did you manage to do that? Um, 
pretty simple. I, uh, I mean, it's just, I'm a sole proprietor of my own business, Don Elizabeth Photo. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a question of legal paperwork, basically. Um, and basically, you just, uh, you're like, okay, I'm going to be, instead of just a photographer, I'm going to be a business. Um, so I went and I researched how to become a sole proprietor um, and chose, because I've been working as a photographer, freelancing, uh, it became like a really good idea for tax purposes to become a sole proprietor. Um, so that's all it is, is, is just legal paperwork. I'm basically still a freelance artist, um, but with uh, the ability to do business as a, um, a business. Gotcha. So, um, the business uh, course uh, for the, the MFA was incredibly helpful, um, teaching us how to, how to become a, a business in and of ourselves. Uh, because when you do that, you have a little bit more protection as an artist. So Google sole proprietorship. Understood. Interesting. Um, does anyone else have a question on the just on the art? The uh, I told you it was very hard to get them talking, Don. I mean, it was hard for everybody to be talking. I was the only one who used to talk. We had to tell you to be quiet. I a think. lot. <laughs> Um, the, uh, you know, it's neat for me to see this work a couple of years past and it still, it still looks very like of the moment of now as it did then. The, you don't happen to have your physical magazine, do you? Somewhere in my recesses of my bookshelves. beans yeah. oh that's it oh yeah. neat um oh let me see if i can oh oh that is it so what size was that just because we dealt with all the dimensions recently uh know. this was i think it's just a basic uh, eight eight point five by eleven it's just a piece of paper um and then i went and it was on oh what was the website it should be in here actually Oh, it was Matt SoundCloud or Matt Cloud or something like that, wasn't something it? Something like that. Um, yeah, it was. It was one of the those wonderful like make your own websites. Um, yeah, and so I, that was my goal was to make my own magazine, and so I did. Oh, it looks so. Yeah, that work really. I mean, what I liked about this is that the magazine format was where it really shone. I think, and that's where it seemed like this is what it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to feel like and how the spreads are supposed to work and all of those things. You know? I, I, fought, I fought very hard for it. Um, it was, people were like, oh, well, not, we're not really, um, we do, we do portfolios, we do portfolios. And I was like, cool, I'll do one. That's fine. It's annoying, but it's fine. Uh, because I was like, regardless, I want a magazine. Always wanted a magazine. Um, so that's what I ended up making. Yeah, you know, and I wonder, so here in this class here, everyone did traditional portfolios. They had radical designs and they had different things going on, but it very, very much was a physical book. In the end, did you ever use your physical book? You know, I'm wondering, you know, like, not the magazine, the, the actual physical portfolio. No, I used my website. Oh, seriously? It was so much easier when I went into interviews to have, be like, my entire portfolio was on my website let's go look at it because everybody has a computer everybody has a projector screen oh interesting so you yeah oh wow oh, that's interesting but i always oh. did bring it with me especially this i always brought this with me because it is nice for people to hold something and still flip through so the physical portfolio is truly just like a doorstop in your apartment right now yes it's it's propping up the plant that's there it is, it is over yonder and my printer is on top of it the um, truth, the truth hurts. Yeah, um, it, no, I, I, sorry, it's, but it is, it is what it is. I, 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 it's cool to have. It's awesome to have. Yeah. Um, if I'll ever need it again, like I spent so much money on it. Uh, it's really cool to have, but I, I don't use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's honest. That's honest for sure. The, um, so let's go into your kind of work trajectory. Actually, it looks and, like uh, we've got a couple questions. Oh, we do. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, do I bring qualities of my thesis work to my current job at Original Stitch? If so what are they? And could we see some examples? Of course. Um, so when I started working at Original Stitch, um, I actually got hired as a social media specialist. Um, and there was no content. So I was like, how am I supposed to be a social media person if I don't have content? Um, so they were like, great, go make it. And I was like, awesome. I can 100% do that. Um, before I... Um, before I started, um, it was all very bland and they were doing nothing but using uh, influencer content. Um, so I can do Instagram.com slash. Um, hopefully I spelled that right. Great. Um, so I've ended up bringing a lot of color um, back into uh, the brand. Um, I've worked uh, to create brands, the brand style guide with everybody. Well, actually, that's a lie. I did it by myself. Um, so that we have a bright, vibrant color. We're not just dull in the background. That's not what we want our brand to be. Um, so I haven't really done a lot with monochromatic work, uh, just because we do want the color contrast to be popping. Um, yeah, so this is some of the work that I get to do. It's lovely. It's fun. Um, I have for the most part, uh, complete creative control, um, and and I and I love it. That looks like you totally right there. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah. And then would you say like myself working commercially? There's always jobs that you're doing for the client, and then the ones where your voice gets to speak louder. You know, and like ones that you can own more, and then ones where you're more part of a team. And yeah. it seems like that probably comes into play with this job. Yes. Yeah. Um, for the most part, we are small. We're only 10 people. Um, so a lot of collaboration does happen. Like this is our project manager who has a wonderful style. So we're like, I tell him, I need, like, I need you in all green. And he's like, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And then there's always somebody to help me, um, to help me hold the, uh, the reflector as well. Team is teamwork is incredibly important. Um, and it's also so much nicer to have people to work with instead of just trying to do everything by yourself. Oh, for sure. So, you know, I, I wanted to save this oh, type of thing to the, to there, the... There, that's one of the ones I did recently. <laughs> oh, that one is. Oh, that's very cool. I wanted to save some of the stuff to the end of your kind of trajectory. But oh. the, the question I think I essentially have here is with original stitch, is it... Who's, who's like leading, you know, who's running the, who's driving the truck? Is it you or is it them? You know, like, it's Yeah, you. it's, um, when I came in, there was a creative director um, who had been doing everything for the creative, on the creative side. Um, battling him was, was a, a tough challenge uh, to come in because it was someone who wasn't willing to work collaboratively. Um, I now have his role and uh, along with another graphic designer, um, and basically it, I was able to come in because it was such a small startup and build the creative department from the ground up, uh, including making the photography guidelines, setting the tone, um, which has been, uh, was a huge challenge, but was really, really awesome to get to have that much creative freedom. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I bet. Do you feel that like looking at the things, it looks like there's locations and there's like the shots have intention to them even if it is just your coworkers that you're using. Are you like, like reserving locations or are you truly, is it all like guerrilla style or, you know? Uh, so basically we, it's, it's, hey, we have a St. Patrick's Day campaign coming up. Okay, great, go shoot it. Um, and then it's, it's all guerrilla style basically. Um, we've gotten in trouble a couple of places, um, but usually it's, it's quick. I'm not using much anything other than um, a reflector unless it's like a very largely planned out shoot. Um, Alyssa, a lot of the time since we've been stuck here, I've been using my roommates um, yeah. and I am lucky enough to have some equipment here. Um, so I've been using my roommates, the equipment that I have and just been getting creative with it, which is right now all that we really can do is just get as creative as possible. Right, right, right. But I mean, it looked like some of the shots, it looked like there was one that was like on a boat, you know what I mean? Or you were in a, in a, some boat area. So you just found the location and just did it. Yep, fast and fast and dirty, like I just like I always have. <laughs> right, right, right. The um, well, no, your previous when you were a student, those things involved many people, 
and they involved a set, an intentional clothing and wardrobe that was selected and a makeup artist doing a certain thing. And so to some degree, you've dialed it down for the, for the original stitch type of approach. It also has to, unfortunately, it comes with the budgeting restrictions. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a small startup. So I get to help out with the budget because it's just me and it's just the model. And that's all we get. Yeah, for sure. So now there is, you know, we are in the middle of this, this pandemic, you know, like unprecedented, like destruction <laughs> of the economy and the photo industry is impacted by this solidly. What there is this philosophy now that the future, the people who can do many things themselves that that's really what the the, what the direction things are going in photography like the idea of having 30 people on set is very frowned upon right now for all sorts of viral implications um and the idea of someone who can do the styling themselves or they can do the you know like can they just work with one assistant? Can they work with no assistants? Can it be done? You know, how simply can something be done? That is something that is in the dialogue right now. And I don't want to focus on life right now because I don't feel like it's always going to be like right now. But you've had this job for a year now? Uh, six months, yep. Oh, six months. Okay. How do you think your abilities to do all these different things played into that? A hundred percent. Uh, I, being so versatile, and this it, it happened at, when I worked at Airbnb as well, uh, versatility is crucial because uh, some, some things aren't going to work. You're not going to have a stylist some days. There's not going to be a budget. There, you won't have a set. So having the ability to do everything yourself um, is incredibly important. Sometimes you won't have to, but the ability to do it is. Uh, at Original Stitch right now, the fact that I was hired for social media but could then become the photographer. Um, I saved the company. I'm doing three different jobs right now. And I, so I'm saving the company tons of money. Um, so yeah, to be able to do all of that and then is, is, is incredibly important. And yeah, there is that feeling like yesterday we had the photo editor from Rolling Stone uh, as a guest artist, Sasha Lekka. Mm -hmm. And you know, what he essentially told a tale of, he was like, well, when I started here, there were seven photo editors, and now there's one, and it's me. And someone did ask him, they said, well, how, why do you think you survived? And he said, well, I was a hard worker, but I could do a lot of different things. You know, he's like, I could, I could edit the rock and roll stuff. I could edit the news photography. I could also do retouching on something if it needed to get done. He's like, I think, you know, I was someone who became more uh, unexpendable. Let's see. I became unexpendable. What would it be? Unexpended. Expendable means that they could get rid of you. Right? I became yeah. not expendable. Yeah. And yeah. And it, when you got into this job, though, that wasn't on your mind, correct? Um, no, no, it wasn't. I We had a creative director uh, who ended up being absolutely terrible. But uh, I, I came in because I wanted to learn a new skill. I wanted to learn social media. And I was hired because I had a, a previous um previously worked with influencers and social media when that was my first job here. I was an influencer photographer. Um, and then when coming in and then it's now, oh, I manage all of our social media platforms and I shoot all of our content and I manage all of our influencer relations. Same happened at Airbnb. I was hired as a photo editor. Um, and then kind of as needs, as things became needed, you just step up and fill the roles. I was a customer server, service expert on the photography side, and then I was recruiting photographers uh, for, for our Plus Edition. So it, it's one of those, you learn as you go, and you do all of the things that you can do. Do you feel that's the nature of these in-house jobs now, is that you get hired for one thing and then one thing leads to another? Absolutely. Um, in the two major companies that I've worked for, Original Stitch and, um, and Airbnb, as well as, as well as Touch of Modern, it was always, you hired for one thing and then you'll learn something else and then that's you'll also what you take on. And then you learn another thing and that's also what you take on. Um, there hasn't been a single time that I haven't had more than three hats on or less than three hats, basically. It's- Oh, interesting. Yeah, I have, I have always, Airbnb, especially, and Original Stitch, you have like a multitude of titles <laughs> of just like CX agent and then like creative recruiter. So do you feel this is indicative of the times or is it indicative of you? 
or is it indicative of startup culture and that's just where you're working now? I think it's a startup culture. I think it really is a startup culture of just having uh, somebody who can do everything. Oh, interesting. So I want to get into just a kind of very like, you know, I graduated, then I did this, then I did this, then I did this. But to uh, Grace Norsini has a question here, as basic as it is, but there are every question is welcome here. What cameras and software do you use? I have a, a Canon uh, Mark III. I'm saving up for the four because um, I love the four. It's great. And I have a B1. I'm lucky enough to have a B1. That was my graduation present. Um, I have, I use Lightroom every single day. Uh, I live in Lightroom. I live in Bridge. Um, I use Photoshop all the time, even for just like little tweaks. Um, for my personal work, I use Capture One. Um, I was very lucky to get to do a, a, a portrait session with a photographer where we tethered to my Capture One and did a live photo shoot. It was really, really cool. Um, so those are the softwares that I'm using most. And then everything. Like, yeah, what's your relationship with Lightroom? What do you use with that? Like, what is your, because people use it for different things, like categorization things, and I'm a big one. I love Lightroom and it changed digital for me, but it was all about the color, you know, like. Yeah. I filters, it's all where all of my presets are. Um, so we need something that's got a blue undertone. Great, I've got filters exactly for that. We have filters that we use on all, almost all of our social media to make everything look really, really consistent. Um, so that's where, that's where I love my Lightroom. Right. And my contact sheets, which is great for, for clients. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, hey, let's back up and, um, so you graduate, then what was your vision of what, you, what you'd be doing upon graduation? Um, I was, I didn't really know. I had hoped that I'd been, I would get a place at a creative agency, um, but due to budget stuff, they couldn't hire me on. So I was a freelance for them. Um, is, let's, let's back up. What is a creative agency? Ah, a creative agency. So New Revolution Media, I don't know if anybody had the discussion with Rusty Sanders, um, is the creative agency is what large companies, they call this place and they're like, hey, we need XYZ deliverables. Do you have a photographer, a videographer, an animator? Great, we'll take the team. Here's the project. Here's the contract. Do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that was the, I worked with New Revolution. I still work with New Revolution Media as a freelancer. So you, your ideal upon graduation was to get a day job. Yes, my, I, I wanted to go straight into being, um, to having that stability, a corporate creative. Uh, that was really what I, what I aimed for. Uh, it didn't happen right, right away. <laughs> right, right. What were the types of jobs? Like, what did you do? Start, what did you do on, you know, uh, you stayed in San Francisco. Yep, I stayed in San Francisco. Uh, and because I was, I was determined to make it work. Um, so I took any job that paid, absolutely anything. I worked as a photojournalist um, and event photographer. I was a nightclub photographer. Um, I worked at a bunch of conferences. I worked for Touch of Modern. I was an e-commerce photographer. I interned with uh, Elena Zakova as her, uh, her, her assistant. Um, I, I had five solidly different jobs and they were just yeah. completely changing. There was no consistency in my life whatsoever. Some days were you, we, I was shooting until four in the morning. Some days I was waking up at four in the morning. Right. Um, a lot of editing, a lot of editing. Right, right. So what you're painting out there is the, in my interpretation, the typical kind of trajectory of a freelance photographer who is piecing together a lot of different things as a way to make a living. Like different clients and different things that they do for those clients and weaving that together to make a living. Yep. Is that accurate? It was a lot of networking. Yeah. Right. I was, I was hopeful to get, uh, to land a solid job at a creative agency. Um, and it didn't happen. I was like waiting, waiting, waiting. So I was just biding my time doing a bunch of different things. Um, until one day I started, it got to the point where I was like LinkedIn every day, applying for absolutely every position, anything that I thought I could do. Um, uh, keeping a very detailed spreadsheet. If you guys want to see my spreadsheet, I'm happy to share it with you. Yeah. It was really massive. Um, I had about a 2% uh, interview rate, which is for every 100 applications or in, uh, resumes I sent out, I got two interviews. So that's kind of what you're going to anticipate. It's, it's, it's a pretty cutthroat out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was even during boom times, you know, or more boom times. And so, 
I'm, I'm steering this down because the students may not even be familiar with what LinkedIn is, you know? Oh. How, okay. how would one, what is LinkedIn and how does someone use it? Oh, LinkedIn is uh, your professional social media, professional social media. So it's like a professional Facebook. Um, it is where you put, where you're working, where you put your resume, um, and it's where people can find you if they're looking for a job, as well as you being able to look for jobs. Um, it's the professional hub. Oh, so if I had some cat videos, can I post those there? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Oh. Unless, you're, unless you're a cat shelter. That's a good point. Hey, could they see your LinkedIn profile? Totally. Absolutely. I love my LinkedIn profile. I worked really hard on it. Um, and I will say, yeah, when I, when I started, I, um, I didn't have a, a LinkedIn. My LinkedIn was non-existent. Um, and now I run our LinkedIn page for my company. Oh, really? So here we go. This is my LinkedIn. Um, it's got a photo. Don't mind the header. It's not a good header. Um, but yeah, it's got a picture of me with my camera because I'm a photographer. Um, has my full name uh, and my uh, and my title. It has where I am currently working and where I went to school. Oh wow! Uh, right now, I am still. I always keep my job posts open just because you never know what's going to come. Uh, job opportunities as any of these. A little bit above about me, which is also you can find in on my website in my the about me section. Just copy and pasted it there. Um, it has my updated resume. So, which is something we will also get into. Um, but just side note, when you're creating a resume, use the Academy resources. Um, my first resume uh, was basically, I, I had my hand held through the entire time um, by, the, uh, by the faculty at, uh, at, the, at the resources center. They were amazing um, and really helped me figure out exactly what I was, what I was doing, because I had no idea. Oh, and this is the Career Resources Center at the Academy of Art. They are amazing. They helped me figure out how to write a cover letter, uh, which I'd never done before. They helped me write my resume by just like me giving them a bunch of information and then they walked me through it. Um, but back to LinkedIn. Uh, and then here's the uh, things that I've been doing. You know, we were been able to post, I don't know if this looks familiar. Yeah. Our Motivation Monday work from home attire. That's my roommate. That's one of our shirts. <laughs> Working with what you have. Um, yeah, and then it has what your experience is. Um, so on here, yep, I've got my social media specialist and lead photographer, which is what I'm currently doing now. Uh, and all of my, uh, the roles. Basically, you wanna just bullet point very um, succinctly what you do. Um, you also wanna add, once it starts happening, like metrics. Uh, like I increased our engagement rate by 43% over three months. Mm. So, little things like that. Um, I am still not the owner of my, of my own company, so I put that there. Um, I worked as a freelance photographer uh, with clients including VMware, Jack Morton, Cushy Punch, and Samsung. Um, I've also worked for the CEO of PayPal at, a, at his personal home. Um, and yeah, I was a plus photo editor at Airbnb. And it's just where all of your, it's like basically just a, a, your resume online uh, where you can really fill things out where I went to school, my volunteer experience, and then people can give you like, um, like skills and endorsements, people can endorse you. Um, so that's what LinkedIn is. Uh, it's very, very important to start getting a job. Um, they have a job section, so you can literally do photographer in San Francisco Bay Area, and it will give you jobs right there that you can apply for, again, it was pretty difficult um, to, because I was applying, spent most of my days applying. And yeah, like I said, 2% were getting back to me. Wow, this is very helpful. And you know, it's something that, uh, no, it was out of my range. I, I didn't know that LinkedIn was so, I always thought it was like that creatives used like Instagram to promote themselves and that LinkedIn was like a corporate thing for bankers and other people and stuff like that. So when you were a student, did you know LinkedIn was such a, a, a thing to begin using or did you learn this later? I learned this later. I learned this after I graduated. Um, I had a friend who works in social media in Chicago and I was like, girl, what am I doing? And she's like, okay. And so, um, 
and you can definitely Google it. It is a learning curve, just like if you were going to learn any other social platform. Um, and, but yeah, I didn't really understand what it was or how to use it. And I just had to really deep dive into it uh, because this is where I found my job, my, my first job at Airbnb and it's where I found my job at Original Stitch. Wow. Wow. That's great. That's great. Can we look at your, report, at your um, uh, resume? Yeah, totally. This these students had to create a resume. Yeah, the resume, I mean, uh, I'm going to, actually, let me find a better resume, 2020, here we go. Let me get you a bigger one, there we go. Okay, um, I suggest uh, using the website Canva, C-A-N-V-A.com. Mm -hmm. um, it has a bunch of like templates that you can just kind of plug and chug and be really creative. For us, as photographers, as creatives, we need to be creative in our like our first impression when we stand out. Um, you need to immediately be like, oh, I'm gonna catch them with color, because that's my thing, I love color. Um, I wouldn't put, as when I was a creative recruiter, I really just liked seeing people's faces. So don't put your face on there. Um, it's become like a trend. I don't like that trend. Um, cool, so it's, a, it's my name and then my title or the title I am looking for. Photographer, social media specialist, corporate creative. Succinct, tells you exactly what I'm looking for. Um, and then it goes into just a little bit about me. I'm a professional corporate creative, specializing in social media marketing, influencer relations, photography, and photo editing. I have a strong history working in tech, startups, and photography industries. Skilled in content creation, campaign ideation, Adobe Creative Suite, art direction, photo editing, and retouching. I can wear all, I can, oh, I should fix that. I, I can and do wear almost any hat while maintaining an outgoing personality and positive attitude. Little blurb right at you, this is what I'm doing. And then the work experience. Uh, this is where you'll um, really talk about what you did for the company, um, as well as adding metrics. How did you decrease spending? How did you enable things to more, work more effectively? Um, the software you are capable of using, um, the skills you have just really, really quickly and very succinctly, the way that anybody could get in touch with you, super important. You're going to want them to, to reach out. Um, your history, your academic history, uh, and then the jobs that you've had. So that's what a resume looks like. Ta-da! You know, that's really good. The, um, no, it's fascinating to see this. Now, if you do not know what you want to do, you know what I mean? Like if you don't, like here you're saying photographer, social media specialist, corporate creative. If you don't already have a title, you know, like what did you put there when you first started? Um, Looking for a job. I didn't. Um, I just had, I somewhere on here is my like, I'm sure I can find my first resume. It's like really, really terrible. The, like, I can't, let me see if I can find my first resume. If you can find it, that's good. I'm going to step away for a second. Oh, okay. here we go. Here's my first resume. Okay. Great. This is what it looks like. Don Elizabeth. Should have put my last name on there, you know. Uh, commercial photographer with experience in directing, producing, and collaborating photo shoots in studio. I just basically wrote what I was doing in college. I was a commercial, I studied commercial photography, and I had been directing all of my own shoots, and I had been doing in studio and lifestyle. Um, I also had my undergraduate degree in sociology. I was a trained sociologist, passionate about capturing depths of human emotion. A lot of bullshit. Just put it in there. Uh, make, you have to, you're really, really, really trying to sell yourself. Let's see. Um, and then I didn't have a ton of experience as a photographer. You know, I got my skills. I've got my software. I was the owner of my own company, so that went on there. I was an intern. I was an assistant. And I was a freelance photographer. To fill the page, I put in all of my publications. Um, you know, I, I was able to, was very lucky to get published uh, a multitude of times my last year. Um, and so I put that in. It oh, let me pause here. Did you, I'm sorry, I stepped away. Did you, uh, did you have your original uh, resume to show us or no? Yeah, right here. This oh, is the first one. We're seeing the same one. We're seeing 2020. Oh, are you? Yep. No. Oh, guys, you have to tell me that. Well, we're telling you now. How about that one? Oh, screen sharing is paused. Resume. Oh, okay, cool. What no, we still see yeah, 2020. Um, there we go. 
girl. Okay, how about this? Can you see this one? That one, and then whoop, where'd it go? Where am I? Okay, let me see if I can't. There, then there should be the other one. Can you see that one? It's still 2020. Dang it. Okay. Um, let me try this. Perfect. Oh, okay. that's it. Yeah. Oh, let's see this. Yeah, so this is the first one. Commercial photographer with expertise in directing and producing collaborative photo shoots in studio and on location for fashion and lifestyle editorials and live event productions. Trained sociologist passionate about capturing the depths of human emotion and experience through the lens of a camera. So that's very different from what you are now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, knowing what you know now, would you rewrite this introductory paragraph? Absolutely not. Because that was exactly where I was when I graduated. So to be devil's advocate, I would say, I'm wondering if someone would say, well, we don't have a job for someone who is a trained sociologist passionate about capturing the depths of human emotion and experience through the lens of a camera. We have, <laughs> I don't know, like I just wonder if it's too, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm looking for you to enlighten it. But like, do you think it's accurate because it is where you were at at the time or something like that? Yeah, I, it was what's, what's going to sound most appealing. Is it someone who also understands society, who, who has studied society and that's part of what she does is when she photographs. Right. It was trying to get this overall picture of who I was as a person and what I'd learned through my time in school. Okay, no, that's fair. That's fair. Although I would say your resume now, it's much more like I can hire her for this. Yes, here I will meet. Okay, let me resume. Oh, no, okay, here we go. We're going to, ah, here we go. Now, so, okay, I figured it out. We've, we've got it. Here we go. Here's yeah. my new, yeah. which yeah. is a lot more like to the point of, here are my skills, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and so I'm just wondering, like I think the thing that the students wrestle with, like when we've tried to do resumes in class, are they essentially are like, well, I don't know, what, I have nothing to put on the resume, you know, or what do I put on the resume when I don't know what to put on the resume, you know? Like, uh, here we go. let me see if I can, new share, here we go, great. Um, yeah, it was basically you put on there, everything that you've done, um, how small, even no matter how small, anything that you've done that aligns with what you want to do. And then do you put down that you know how to use like Photoshop and Lightroom? That's in the software section and the skills right here. Okay. And Would yeah. you put down that you know how to like use a Hasselblad camera or something like that? If it's uh, relevant, absolutely. The, um, on your first resume, did you include jobs that you, right now we're looking at the 2020 resume. Um, Are you? Yeah. Oh, sharing is paused, resume sharing, there we go. There it is. Uh, let's look down, oh, software, phase one certified, Photoshop Bridge, PowerPoint, Word, Excel, Google Docs. Yeah. And then you have publications and exhibitions. That's really good to show what you're doing. Skills, art direction, camera operations, photo editing, in studio, on location, set lighting, post-production. I think one of the students also was wrestling with, how do you define what type of post-production you can do? <laughs> like, can you do, should you say high-end post-production? Should you say minimal, functional post-production? Like, is there a range or should you, you're simply trying to let them know you're comfortable doing that? Yeah, you're just letting them know that you're comfortable post-producting and they'll tell you what there's generally always a little bit of a learning curve and you'll get taught a little bit um on the job about what kind of what they're really really looking for so just letting them know like yes i know how to work in photoshop and i can retouch um right. i was retouching homes i was when i worked at airbnb i was retouching different um different living rooms uh that was basically what i was doing and right. my post-production work was in retouching skin Oh, okay. 
All right. No, interesting. So, right, they trained you on how to do what they needed you to do. Um, so, okay, your first job then that you got through LinkedIn was your first full-time job was what? Uh, my first full-time job uh, was being a photo editor at Airbnb. Oh, wow. So Airbnb, definitely big deal company, big deal buzz company, beautiful offices, beautiful everything, peak San Francisco 2019 <laughs> experience. Oh, um, what happened at an interview? Um, like, it was really, really chill. Uh, they were blitz scaling. Um, so they were hiring on a lot of people at the time. Um, working with other creatives in a corporate setting is incredibly comfortable because you're all, you're, you're like all creatives together. So my interview, I had a phone interview. I was actually in Hawaii. Um, when I had my phone interview, he's just like, Hey, can you hop on a call? And I was like, absolutely. Um, so I hopped on a call. He kind of asked me what my experience was, uh, what softwares I was able to work in. Um, what I'd been doing up until then, uh, and when I could start. Uh, I just kind of talked about how I loved photography. I was good at retouching. Color and light balance was something I was very, very skilled in. Um, then when it came into the interview at the office, um, we just sat down, had a cup of coffee, and we just basically chatted. It, it was honestly, my skills had already shown uh, because of my website, they're like, great, we know, we can see that she can retouch. We can see that she's got a great understanding of color and light. Then it was basically like, oh, well, she meld well with the team. Oh, personality. Personality-wise, yep. There was a phone call and then there was an in-house visit. Yep. And then you started the job. And I started the next week. Oh, nice, nice. And then were you comfortable with what you were being paid? Was it not enough? Was it, you know what I mean? Like, where did that fit in? I was getting paid, uh, a very decent amount of money. I was getting paid $35 an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got a raise six months after that. Oh, nice. So you felt it was livable to be living in San Francisco, which is the most expensive city in, in the world. Ah, uh, but uh, yeah, yes. But you know, have to, you have to learn how to live within your means. Like currently I live with six roommates. Oh, seriously? Yeah. yeah. It's, you just, if i uh, trying to live in a studio apartment on, on any salary, unless you're making six figures is like not doable. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Um, the, uh, this is all great information. The, um, how long did you work at Airbnb? And then what did you do there? Uh, I worked at Airbnb for a year um, before they did a bunch of layoffs, unfortunately, which I don't know if anybody's heard. They just laid off another 25%. Yeah. It's been, it's been a tough one. Uh, so I worked there for a year. Um, I got brought on as a photo editor and quality assurance, which is I basically would look through um, about 100 listings a day uh, and critique their photos um, as they were coming in. So we had photographers out there. They would send us photos and we would be like, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And then we'd either send them back out to reshoot them again or... Uh, we would pass them along and they would get post-processed by the post-processing team. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. The, um, and then as far as like on a scale from one to 10 with ton, 10 being a dream job and one being like a hell job, where did this fall into the scheme of things? This was an 11. Oh, seriously, you loved it. I loved working at Airbnb. Um, the work was completely doable. There was, there was room for growth. Uh, the team was amazing. Uh, the perks were unheard of. I got fed. I didn't have to buy groceries because I had three meals a day. Um, and the work was completely doable. Um, and I was getting, I was getting paid and I had healthcare. That's and, wonderful. Yeah. And I, uh, I grew incredibly close to my team. Uh, we were all in it together until all of us got laid off. Um, yeah. And I'm like still very, very good friends with all the people I worked with. Right. It was a right. Huge oh, interesting. It was a crazy culture. Like my dog got to come with me every day. That's it nice. Awesome. So the, um, when you get hired at like Airbnb, did you think it was going to be five years? Did you think it was going to be a year? Did you think it was going to be six months? Like what were your expectations in this kind of startup culture that we're in, but still the boom company? So I was a contractor. So I was contract to hire. 
Um, in San Francisco, you have your contract for 18 months. Um, and then they have to, either they have to hire you or they have to let you go. Um, so the turnover rate uh, was incredible because there's always another photographer, there's always another photo editor. Um, basically, it was you hoped and you prayed that you somehow stood out enough to get a red badge over a blue badge. Um, but we had expiration dates, basically. So I was anticipating staying there for a year and a half. What do you mean by there's always another photographer, there's always another photo editor? I would assume that continuity would be valuable to the company. Uh, not because once you hire someone full time, um, you have to pay them more, you have to give them more benefits. Um, with a job like ours, there's a rollover rate. Oh, so there was an expectation that, oh, okay, there's going to be a time limit on this and then I'll move on. Uh, it, was un it was an understanding um, as we, because once we, when we started, we were like, oh, like, we want to get hired like full time, full time, full time. And kind of as it went on, we're like, nobody's getting hired full time. Oh, really? It became apparent. Yeah. Um, so then there was layoffs and that caught everybody by surprise, I take it? No, we, we saw it coming. We were, our manager was very, very transparent with us and he's like, pimp up your resumes. Um, so during that time, uh, this was after I'd become like a CS agent and then also after I was a creative recruiter. It was one of those like as things kind of slowed down, the company was doing very well. Uh, they were shifting everybody to like fill the roles that were needed to be filled um, if there wasn't enough work. Uh, and so when, when your manager tells you pimp up your resume, you're like, got it. Uh, right. So I did. I redid my resume and um, I started applying for jobs. Wow. So then what was, how hard was it to get a job? How easy was it to get a job? Uh, what was the trajectory there? Like I said, it was uh, a 2% interview rate for all of the, um, for everything basically. Um, I will see if I can find my uh, beloved spreadsheet. Um, because I got to the point where I was applying to so, so many jobs, um, that if I didn't, hadn't kept a spreadsheet, I would, uh, I would have lost. I wouldn't have known what I'd applied for. I would have probably applied to like the same thing over and over again. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So it was, it was a lot. It really was. <laughs> Job search, there it is. Okay. All right, guys. Let me see, okay, there it is. Let me turn that off. Cool, and let me turn that on. Wonderful. Let me see, there we go. Cool. All right, so this was um, my job search. Um, I, during the time at Airbnb, I ended up getting pretty good at spreadsheets. Um, I love my spreadsheets. I'm obsessed with spreadsheets. If you don't work in spreadsheets, it's an incredibly important asset to learn. I use, I'm in and out of spreadsheets every single day. Basically everything I do is tracked in spreadsheets. Um, so I basically put the date I applied, the company I was trying for, uh, the job title, the location, the state, and then I created statuses yeah. uh, to see where I was um, in the interview process uh, and then the job link. So I could always refer back to it. Yeah. Um, I was also willing to move anywhere. Um, I, my boyfriend and I just broke up. I didn't need to be here. Um, so I was looking at literally every state. Right. Right. Well, wow. all of these jobs in photography is very inspiring. Yeah. Me, you well, know. There's also social media stuff because I was like, I could do that. Um, yeah. So I, I basically tried for, you can see, I tried for 20, 21 days. And yeah. here are the only two that I got. Oh, which ones? Uh, the, the influencer marketing specialist, which is the job I currently have, and yeah. a creative assistant to a CEO. What is the Tron Foundation? Um, it is a, uh, it's one guy, Tron, uh, who does, um, 
I think it's something to do with like AI or security. Uh -huh. He was this big startup guy and wanted a basically a personal creative to follow him around and do all the social media stuff. Um, I oh, wasn't interesting. I wasn't well versed in videography, which he also wanted. So that's why they passed on me. Right, right. Look at these jobs though. Abercrombie and Fitch, associate art director, Amazon, digital photography technician. Yeah. Um, Levi's assistant buyer, uh, workforce photography art director, uh, outcast agency. I work with them all the time because they do public relations, digital coordinator. Um, what's BCV, do you recall? Um, I think it was um, a creative agency. Really? Miami. Junior photographer in Miami, Florida. Yeah, also a lot of what I've learned now is a lot of places and a lot of recruiters will not like look at your resume if you're not in the state already. Like they're looking to hire somebody locally rather than having somebody come in. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. No, it, yeah, it's probably a little easier to move forward if they can find who they're looking for locally. Yeah, um, uh, and a lot, a lot of this is, and this is something that's going to be really tough. Don't get discouraged. Um, all of the blue is the things I applied to that I never heard back. They just, they'll just open it and say nope, and then that's it, and they won't, and they won't talk to you. Um, so if you hear nothing back, it happens. That happens in all of photography. Yeah. You know what I mean? That happens in you know, bidding for an ad agency job, <laughs> you know, a job that you got asked to bid for, that happens in editorial, that happens in everything. It is interesting though, here's Applied Photography, which I think is a magazine, they need a photo editor. Um, yeah, it's fascinating to see what's out there. Christian Orth Studio, I don't know who that is, but photo um, editor. It was, uh, it was a, just a photographer who was looking for an assistant or a photo editor. Oh, interesting. So this is, and I, I yep, I kept in and like you, you can see, like I was applying to, you know, 10, 15 jobs a day, just pretty consistently. So looking for a job was a full-time job? Was it a part-time job? What was it? Um, it was something I could do while I was watching TV. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, it was, I, here, I'll show you. Um, I have Canva. Can you still see my screen? We can. Yep. Canva. Cool. Uh, Canva was where I have everything. This is where all my designs are. Um, and it's also where I put in all of my like base cover letters. So if I was applying for a photographer role, I would pull this. If I was then applying for, oops, go away. Um, if I was applying for a, like you can see cover letter for Tron, cover letter for PG&E, social media cover letter. Um, I had one for each of the different um, roles I was contemplating applying for. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is good. So uh, here's a note, um, if you don't mind me reading. Go for that it. says, I'm, I'm working at Original Stitch, it's a social media specialist. So this was something where you had a job and you were kind of looking for another job. Yep. Yes, this was, this was after my Airbnb. Um, right. So what you'll do is a cover letter for, um, for this. So basically, even if you look just um, right here, this is while working as a freelance photographer, the majority of my clientele were influencers. So it's basically whoever you've worked with. If you're the majority of your clientele is models, is stylists, is anybody, if it's your mom. Um, I talked about how we brought that together. Um, so all of my influencer work I did, uh, basically in my first year I was in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. and I beefed up the numbers. So I've been working with the same influencer for four years. Uh, we did grow her brand together and we increased her sponsor cost by 50%. Nice. Yeah. Nice. The, when you say you're working with free, with influencers, what does that mean? Uh, so when I first started in San Francisco, I started reaching out to bloggers here just all over Instagram and was like, Hey, I'm a new, I'm a photographer new to the city. I would love to shoot with you, uh, for free. I'd love to test shoot. Um, and so that's how I started growing my clientele base. Um, and then I started getting gigs like I was the head for SF Fashion Week. I was the head photographer. Um, and it was a lot of networking. I spent most of my time my first year networking with influencers, with bloggers, reaching out to people on Instagram, trying to shoot with them, um, and just really, really growing my brand, myself as a brand. Right. 
Right, and that was for you as a, just a sole photographer. Yep. The, um, uh, this is interesting. So Airbnb laid everybody off. We looked for a job for whatever it was, 22 days or something like that? Yep. Yeah. And then you came into this job that you currently have, but you weren't photographing. It was just as a social media person. So it came, I came in, yeah, as a, uh, as a social media specialist uh, to, to do the stuff with the social media. But yeah, because they didn't have content. I was like, I can't, I can't do my job if there isn't content to be shared. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to go make the content that we're going to share. Um, and so that's where like my skills came in a hundred percent. They were like blown away. They were like, why hasn't this been done before? Um, and so now they're like, great, you're head of creative. Enjoy. Do you think that they anticipated that from you when they hired you? Yes, absolutely. Oh, you do? Yes. Um, I don't think they knew to which extent it was going to be and how much of my job it was actually going to become. I think they really underestimated how um, important strong photography is, and um, especially on social platforms. Uh, they really, really underestimated having it. They were just using influencer stuff. Um, so when I came in, I kind of was just like, Hey, this is what, this is what we need. And so I'm going to create it. And so I created it all, uh, myself. And I think they did know it coming in because they did look at my portfolio and they were very impressed and they were like, Oh, like eventually she can lead in this, into this direction. But it can't, I had to come in full force, uh, doing it. <laughs> doing right. It. Right. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Interesting. How long do you think you'll be at this job? Uh, with, in the current climate, it's, it's tough to say. Oh, for anybody in any job. Let's ignore, let's ignore the current climate. Let's just assume, like, do you feel like you would, because I'm more fascinated with what it's like to have a day job and if, if a day job for a creative such as yourself is something that offers exponential growth or is it the kind of thing where, oh, no, I'll do everything I can do here and then have to move on. It's a, I'm, I'm at this job because I really wanted to learn um, a skill other than photography in the creative and in the corporate world. I wanted uh, to be as versatile as physically possible. Um, so I'm at this job to learn as much as I can. And I will learn as much as I can until I no longer can. And then I will find something else. Oh, that's, I think that's pretty universal with every job is you, there's a period where you're struggling to figure it out. There's a period where you're doing it really well. And then there's a period where you're like a senior in high school and you're ready to leave. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So no, that's, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty true. Do you ever see yourself going back to freelancing again? Or do you feel like there's two paths that a creative can do? And one is like having a day job and one is being a freelancer. So I do still freelance on the weekends uh, for the creative agency, New Rev. Um, well, when we were, doing this because uh, freelancing is great. It's a great side hustle. I love having, being able to do both. Um, I was not a fan of freelancing. I really didn't enjoy it. Um, the lack of structure was really difficult for me. Um, so I think I will probably maintain uh, a, a nine to five for, for my life. Um, yeah. Although Rusty Sanders and I have discussed opening up our own business as well um because she just moved to seattle so maybe who knows right right i mean there was a period where every photographer was a freelance photographer there were no day jobs you know like in the 90s or it was very tiny do you feel that this is something that suddenly there is more of now um as far as like there's more freelancers or as there's more like no there's a lot more um opportunity for creatives to get a nine to five absolutely okay. Absolutely. Like infin infinitely more than ever existed. Like especially just on visuals are so important. Marketing is massive right now. Uh, the ability to to really manipulate visuals and and send them out a marketing message is is huge. Um, well, that. But I think also there was an era where it was almost like all photography was freelance unless it sucked. You know what I mean? Like like an old school company like General Electric would have some old man as their in-house photographer or something like that. But then everybody else was like Annie Leibovitz and Richard Avedon and that sexy world of, of being that freelance photographer. And I think that those days are ending. 
you know, I, like, I, agree. Um, I, yeah, I, a lot of, a lot of stuff is in house now. Absolutely. And there's companies like Salesforce and then, you know, they have a big photo team and then Airbnb did, you know, and will again, you know, and so. You had multiple photo teams for like everything. You had your regular houses, you had your plus houses, your deluxe houses. We had an Airbnb magazine. Yeah. And the, it's, it's a lot of people are, are really taking a hold of, of what it means to be a creative and really uh, pushing it. Yeah. No, I think we're in the era of the day job for photographers. I do. You know, I always, I always wanted, I never really wanted to freelance. I always really wanted to become a corporate creative um, and have a day job. So right. I have a day job. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. The, um, you know, I think this is great, but let's turn to the students now. And, you know, I'd like you to all ask a question. And I know that maybe some of these things have been answered, but let's, you know, Don can go off on any topic. And so, but I think that this is a good chance for you all to, um, to meet someone who has a day job as a photographer. <laughs> we really, before Don, I don't think I, I even knew anybody who did, you know? Like, and I was a working photographer, I am a working photographer, but like every single person I knew was a freelance photographer. That was the older model. And I do think things are changing. Yeah, know? most, uh, almost all of my, my photography friends have day jobs uh, or they work at a creative agency uh, as a photographer during the day. Really? Now, how about your fellow graduates? Have you stayed in touch? Um, somewhat. Rusty, I mean, Rusty and I are best friends. Um, so it doesn't count though, I, because we're connected then. I mean, like, you know, like as a student at the academy, you have, you have so many people who are, you know. Yeah. Um, no, unfortunately, I haven't really stayed in contact with, with much of them. I know uh, Marie, Maria is, uh, she's a fitness coach now. She's married in Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Nicholas moved back to Texas, and I'm not quite sure what he's doing. Um, yeah. I, yeah I mean, a lot of people leave the city, too. Oh, you know I, what I mean? If, if I hadn't, if I wasn't in a relationship when I graduated, I would have left the city 100%. Can't Why? Afford to, I can't afford to live here. Whew. Heck no. It's so expensive here. True. Are there more opportunities here or is it just expensive? No, there's, there are more opportunities, but every big city will have an opportunity. Yeah, this one, this one definitely more than most, I mean, but you're going to get the tech startups and that's the niche you're going to be in. Some other places have different types of, of vibes, maybe real estate or whatever, um, that that's what you're going to end up going for and like you'll right. be working in sectors right right also here and there are tons of opportunities but i think there's opportunities in every city i agree yeah no for sure and especially with this day jobby type of thing there was a time as a freelance photographer where you needed to be in new york or you needed to be in los angeles and then you were flown to these different places and stuff like that and so that is over even before covid19 that was coming to a close you know yeah, i think a lot of it is like having it in-house, having it able to like, you have these tasks and assignments rather than having to make it a whole production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, let's see if there's questions. Uh, Grace Norsini, thank you for coming to the class. Do you have any questions? Oh, I've got, uh, I've got one person. Uh, Fabio's got a question. Oh, Fabio's awesome. Great uh, question. Where would you like to be in five years as a photographer? Um, I would like to be uh, managing my own creative team. Um, uh, you know, move the you start and then you get a manager title. Um, so I would love to be to be managing uh, my creative a creative team for a brand. Now, isn't that what you're doing now, though? I am not managing the creative team. I am I am managing the influencers, but I am I work on a team. Oh, I get it. You're the main creative. Yes, yes, I'm the main creative. I have a uh, an email specialist next to me and a graphic designer on my other side, and then we have a marketing manager. Um, I'm I'm technically on the marketing team. But I just, I make up our teeny tiny uh, creative department, which is just two of us. Okay. So when you say manage a creative team, explain what that is. Who um, would be on the team? Uh, it would be someone like me, a social media specialist. I would still probably be doing all the photography. Um, having a graphic designer, understanding more of the realm of, of marketing um, and how we can grow marketing strategy using uh, creatives. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ying Hang, uh, Ying Hang Yi, John. 
he's our car photographer. Nice. He uh, he's a, he's a commercial voice for sure. He has ten questions, I'm sure. Uh, Ying Hei Yi John. Um, I really like um like uh how you talked about like the resume and like the LinkedIn stuff, and then I'm trying to see as like you know like myself trying to be like commercial like photographer. Should I be starting out like, you know, getting a like nine to five job, you know, working somewhere for for that? Um, I mean, I would especially advise against getting any random nine to five. Uh, there okay. was a time that I like definitely thought about it. I'm like, oh, this isn't working. Um, but honestly, uh, the best thing you can do is start assisting. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm like thinking to do, like to assist somebody, you Absolutely. know, in the industry. Start, start assisting. Uh, assisting Elena Zakova was uh, was huge in like my understanding of, of the way the world worked, the way photography worked, um, mm -hmm. and kind of the way a freelance life would go. Um, but yeah, so definitely start assisting. That's like a, a huge, great first step. I forgot that you assisted her. So what did you get from that, and how did that change? It sounded like you learned what the freelance life was like and then made a U-turn. Um, yes. Well, I was also doing a lot of editing. I was doing mostly, I was doing her editing work. Um, and I really, really enjoyed that. I found out that I really enjoyed working in Lightroom, doing color and light balance with uh, filters and presets. Um, I loved being able to just sit down at a desk and just work rather than like having to run around, carry a bunch of like lighting equipment. Um, so I realized like that's really where I wanted to be. So that's when I started looking for photo editor roles. Oh, interesting. Interesting. You know, that is a neat point there, that the idea of being an assistant could turn you on to something that you didn't even know you liked. Yeah. And then you're actually, you know, like, find you're doing it. Um, John's work is very commercial, such as yours was, you know. And um, yeah, it is interesting. John, do you have any other questions? Because it is kind of like your work is such a kind of, uh, it's a very straight line to what you would think John would end up doing. You know, sure, sure. Um, I don't think I have anything for now, but I think because you like colors so much, but do you have to really be like the for like products and all that stuff? Do you have to be like truly, you know, does people really care about what the color is because you're, you're using like filters and like presets and all that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, color is like super important, especially mm -hmm. to kind of brand recognition. Yeah. Um, while I do presets, they're presets that I've created mm -hmm. to make sure that the work looks consistent uh, yeah. throughout. But yeah, no, colors, colors massive. Okay, thanks. Color shooting product. <laughs> you want it to be shooting products and shooting brands. You want it to be true to form. You don't want to give mm -hmm. them uh, shoot a blue shirt, make it purple, and then somebody orders a purple shirt and they get a blue one. Yeah. Oh, this real consistency, especially if you're selling that product. So it has that, like, you know what you're getting. Oh, I can see that being very important. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. I thought more of like what the brand looks and feels like, you know what I mean? But then, yeah, if there's a product, you gotta be like, that's the thing. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, another question. Ruby, do you have a question? I do have a lot of questions, actually. So um, first of all, I'm wondering, since you had jobs before and since you have a lot of experience before, um, do you have any tips on how to negotiate the pay and the salary? Um, negotiating pay and salary. Uh, basically, for your first job, you kind of under want to understand what your time is worth. Um, knowing what the industry is, understanding what the industry standard is, uh, doing a little bit of research of what you should be expecting to get paid. Um, if you're look, if you're working for a nine to five, they'll generally already have a set pay rate. Um, but if you are working freelance, yeah, understanding what your time is worth and and really sticking with that um, is is definitely something. It's hard to learn because it's really hard to like fight for what you want rather than just being like, oh, like no, it's fine. Like it's, I'll I'll do this job for two hundred dollars when it definitely should have been a two thousand dollar job. Yeah, so it's it's a lot. Of find those things out. Yeah, how how would a student find those things out? Google it. A lot of it is googling. Um, looking at at Glassdoor, 
indeed a lot of those will will have like salary bases um for for what you're looking for and understanding you know, what your cost of living is how much are you spending in a year so how much do you need to be making in a year to be able to cover those costs it's a lot spreadsheets are great guys let me just tell you spreadsheets are great but it is a lot of it's a lot of research and a lot of work into looking at at what it's going to take for you to continue to live life in, in the way that you've been living it ah interesting interesting um the ruby did that make sense yes let's hear your other questions um i kind of lost them <laughs> um maybe go go to some other people and then i'll try to read it. yeah <laughs> Okay, sounds good. Uh, Ricky, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I was wondering if you found it easy, um, or not necessarily easy, but rather like whether or not you thought the fact that you have a photography degree to, like, was the deciding factor when you were looking for jobs, not specifically as a photographer? Uh, as in like they, when they wanted me? Yeah, so like you, you mentioned you worked as like a photo editor and also a social media specialist, but do you think that like the reason you got those jobs was because you had like such a background in the arts? Absolutely. Um, I actually didn't have to take um, any of the photo editing tests. Uh, so a lot of companies, they'll give you a test uh, and be like, I want, I want you to edit out this or tweak this or redo this. I didn't have to take any of those because I had a degree. Um, which was awesome. And and I got the job I have now because of my uh, work that I did with Touch of Modern for men's fashion. Um, you know, it's one of those you never really understand like what's gonna spark someone to to hire you. It could be the time that you were an assistant for a day with one person and you learned something and that, that one thing is what this company is looking for. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, that's a good question, Ricky. Yeah, the power of the degree, you know, like there's always this idea that like, oh, art school, the degree doesn't matter at all. You know what I mean? It's just the just the work you produce. How do you feel about that? Um, I mean, the work definitely speaks for itself, but it's honestly like having having my MFA like bypassed a lot of things for me. It looked really, really good on my resume. Nice. Uh, but But having that like, like they're not if you have an art degree, especially in photography, they're not going to question your skills basically. If they've seen your work and they're like, oh, well, you have a degree in this, you have the skills. Oh, that's a good point. There's many people calling themselves photographers these days, like every single person on the planet. And so, yeah, having the, the degree helps. There's a, a situation here where students, you know, these are all graduating seniors. And there's a situation here where students have said, well, I don't want to go into photography. What does this portfolio matter? And my advice to them is, well, it shows the completion of like a creative project, no matter what you end up doing. And it shows the depth to which you can think about something and bring something to life. And the tangibleness, you know, kind of matters there. Do you Absolutely. have any, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, if, even if you don't decide to go into photography, you know, like I switched careers in, in social media now, uh, the completion and the, full, like the fullness of a project is so important. Uh, parallels with like a campaign ideation where you think of a campaign you mood board then you pr do the production and the pre-production and the hiring and the casting and then you do the shooting and then you do the set, take up the set down and the set up and the takedown and uh, then you do the post-processing and then you have the final product um, all of that is really really impressive and it does show that you have the ability to start a project from beginning to, and then to end that's a good point yeah 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 it's a really good point the, um, uh, that's good. Ruby, did you remember your question yet? Oh yeah, it was um, the interview one. So you say there's a photo editing test? Yeah, so for Airbnb, uh, there was an actual edited test um, where they would give you uh, an image and they were like, fix it. It would be skewed or something would be off, there'd be dust on the lens. Oh really? Oh wow. Make it better. And you're like, okay. Or like edit something out. Like so, there would be. We had a couple of times where like photographers would have a picture of them, and there would be a reflection in the mirror or something, and you were like, "Okay, edit that out." Oh, that's wild. Yeah. So it was that was the uh, that was the photo editor test, but I didn't have to take it because I have a degree. Oh, interesting. Interesting. 
Would you have known how to do those things? Um, I definitely would not have been like nearly as confident. <laughs> and so I'm like really happy they didn't ask me to do it. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't have been as confident as they assumed you would have been. Yeah, because I'm coming in like I, I learned a lot of things about uh, photo editing um, that were very brand specific to Airbnb when I got there um, yeah. and I, I'm one that I wouldn't have known to do uh, prior. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I always think that artists, they know how to do, they know how to retouch for their photos, but they, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I would have, I was retouching skin and, and, and models. I would have, I had no idea how to retouch a house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, hey, Lena, do you have any questions? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, cool. So I have a, a question about, like, do you have time for your, like, continue doing your personal work while working? Like, do you, can, do, can you manage that? I just, I feel like I want to continue doing my personal work uh, while working, but I don't know if it's like, I don't know, like there's a balance for you to do that. Um, well, definitely it's, uh, it's about the time you take and the time you make to take the time. Um, you know, there's always so much time in a day. Uh, I have definitely slowed down on my personal work, except for being in quarantine. I'm not working on self-portraits. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll always have the weekends. Um, and it, it's about how much time and effort you want to take into continuing your personal work. Um, you know, you'll, you'll make the time if it's something that's really important to you. Okay, and your personal work is uh, like the ones that you were showing us that it's uh, like models in the street and I don't know, like more like life, lifestyle kind of? Yep, yeah, I do a lot of just like uh, lifestyle work now. Um, I am very, very fortunate enough to have um, space in my apartment if I want to set up a mini portrait studio. Um, I'm actually very lucky. I live across the street from JCX Expendables if I want to go pick up a small seamless. Oh, wow. um, yeah, I'm very like I'm very like I'm fortunate. I previously in my in my previous apartments I didn't have the luxuries of the space and the the ability to do all of this stuff. So you know, I'll say it again: use all of your resources at the academy while you have them, because they're once you get out in the real world, you're like, I have to spend how much money to get the same stuff for a day? Oh, oh yeah, renting gear, yeah, for a shoot. It, it's cool. It's definitely awesome that that's like a thing. But man, whew, renting gear for a shoot is uh, is a hassle. Yeah, it's a hassle. It takes an extra day, and then there's money. Oh, um, heavy. Heavy. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, and this is you just start lifting weights now, because a lot of photography positions will be like must be able to lift fifty pounds. <laughs> Which I was just like, no. Oh. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, Lena, do you have anything else? And I have a question, but it's more about like the social media, like Instagram. Um, how uh, was the process for you, like trying to grow the the brand? Is it like is it what like an easy? I just I just have a lot of uh, conflict with Instagram lately, so sometimes it's very like painful for me to post because it's hard to reach the people that you want it. So I'm just yeah. um, when I started my Instagram, it was my life. Um, so I'm, I'm managing the Instagram now for the, for the company, but I started by growing my own. Um, I tried everything. It's, they're exhausting. Um, basically you have to be on Instagram, um, a half an hour before engaging with your community, a half an hour after you have to do so much hashtag research. You have to be tagging the right people. You have to be reaching out, commenting, messaging a bunch of people. Um, it, it got to the point where I, I gave up my Instagram for like, six months. I was like, I'm done. I tap out. This is, this is dumb. Um, but when I first started, it was vital. Uh, it was where I met all of my clients. I was reaching out to bloggers and being like, let me shoot you. Um, it was where I was networking with a large group of people. I would, I would make Facebook groups. Um, and we would just be chatting. Uh, it really is like a huge network and that's how it likes to be viewed. Um, so that was really what I was doing. And it just, it took so, so much work. It took so much work. It took a lot of collaboration. It wasn't easy. Uh, I tried to take the easy way out and buy followers, uh, which absolutely crashed my engagement. And I'm I like still haven't completely recovered from that. Um, it yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot of work, and it it's 
I, yeah, it got to the point where at one point I gave up and I had to do a rebrand to restart my own Instagram. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and, uh, and the one with the company that you're working, um, that one is, uh, the, they give you money for uh, advertisement, like, the, like they have like money for working on Instagram, basically? So we do Instagram ads. Uh, which is just like, an, uh, we'll pay for one of our images to just be like an ad, like as you're scrolling. Um, and then we also have a budget for influencer marketing where we will collaborate with an influencer, send them product and they'll do posts. They'll give us content that we can then repost. Uh, and then that way we're reaching their audience as well. Um, but since this has been a tough time, our budget has like shrunk to like nothing. So we are having to do pretty much all organic engagement at this time, which is my job. By this time, you mean COVID-19 time? COVID-19 time. We've, we've slashed our budget uh, basically to nothing for social media, um, which is a very interesting challenge for me that I really actually have enjoyed because I have to now convince people not to get paid <laughs> and to still do the work. Uh, and I'll be like, I'm going to give you product and you're going to post. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> and they're like, oh, really? yeah, it's been surprisingly okay. Um, as far as because you just have to reach out to new people really really create and again it's about creating a community on instagram it's about being incredibly real uh i mean there's fake instagram of course but like it's about when you want to grow things organically it's about being real and being a person and a lot of uh what i found is posts that include yourself or like something you're talking about um like blurbs on how you're feeling uh things with like for the, the company i work for our highest engagement have been like team photos and like getting to know the team. So it is about being like a real person on there. Right now, for sure. There is a vibe where I feel like everyone wants to, everyone is hit, everyone is hurt. And so everybody need, everybody's willing to bet, I think, you know what I mean? Like there's no one that's not impacted by this. And so. Everybody's willing to compromise. I think so. We're all, I mean, we're all in the same kind of boat. So it's like, okay, you know what? I won't do it for money. We know in the future it will be. I'll do it for a product. Um, we'll make something together. We're still working. Uh, it's still mutually beneficial. I think that vibe is out there. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I've had clients ask me if I could cut bills in half, which is something I'm not used to doing. And then the feeling is like, yeah, right now we can, you know, like we're willing to bend actually like half now half later i know i know <laughs> yeah so and that's also what it is is yeah my my pay, my salary's been cut by 15 percent um and but they gave us friday off oh seriously oh interesting yeah, interesting like, okay we're taking away your money but maybe just don't work one day okay great i can do that oh that sounds like a healthy way to keep people happy and still save money mm -hmm. and try to keep things moving yeah, interesting. Hey, Bella, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a question about interview. Like, uh, uh, when we have the interview, what we sh should take care about? Like, what we should do before interview, and uh, what we sh and uh, what we should do when we in the interview, like. Uh, great question. Um, basically, what you want to do is you want to practice. You want to do a ton of practice interviews because uh, the number one thing that I've learned when either interviewing someone or being interviewed is confidence is like super duper key. Like you have to be able to speak incredibly conf confidently and, and, and know about your subject. Um, look up practice interview questions like what have you been, what, what's experience do you have? Um, where were you before? Some interview questions will ask you, there, when there was a problem, how did you solve it? They'll give you examples of problems and you have to like, you have to kind of already understand and know what you're gonna say. Um, and yeah, come, just come prepared. Come prepared with, with uh, there's a lot of interview questions online um, that you can look up and have answers to so you're not completely surprised when they ask you, say there's a, they'll give you an example like, oh, you have a tough coworker, how do you deal with it? What's your managing style? I've been asked that question, like what's your managing style? Um, how would you manage a team? Like what's one thing you would do? Communication, that's always my answer. 
Um, so it's, it's understanding what kind of questions you're going to probably get asked and having the answers already kind of prepared in your head. Yeah, and uh, my next question is, um, when we are uh, when we are in interview and introduce our portfolio or project, we always introduce our recently the most in recently uh, project, right? Yeah. Um, all I mean, always honestly start with your best one. So if you've got a recent one that's like okay, but then you have this really like amazing massive one. like I I've been working um like the blue shoot I did that was a lifestyle shoot that's not the project I'm going to present I'm going to present the work I've done at original stitch or the my thesis I'm going to be like here is my thesis work because this is my biggest bestest project and then you say oh and then recently I've been doing x y and z oh a main dish and a side dish or yeah. something like that. you want to be like uh this is what this is like my the best bestie best best work I can do and then this is what I've been doing recently Oh, yeah, that, that is a good point that your best thing isn't always your most recent thing. Yeah. Although sometimes in school, cool it typically, you know, what's that? Would, that would be really cool if it was, but yeah, like my, <laughs> my, my recent work is I'm shooting, I'm shooting shirts. Like I'm, I'm shooting product shirts. It's not my, it's not my best work. My best work is my thesis work. So that's what I'm going to show. Well, your new work might speak to the marketplace better, though. Absolutely, it definitely will depend. If I'm if I'm interviewing for Fashion Nova, a hundred percent they're getting my thesis. But if I'm going to interview for Levi's, they're more likely to get the product work. Yeah, yeah, right, or a combination of both. Yeah. Um, oh, that's interesting. Those are good questions, Bella. Do you have anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Thank you. That's good. Hey, Joel. Hi. Um. Uh, I'm wondering if, like, while you were working at Airbnb, did you still take interviews with the other jobs that you applied to? And if you wanted to decline it, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, um, I think it's always great to be interviewing, even if you have no intention of taking the job. It's great practice. Um, really? it's always, yeah, absolutely. It's always awesome to see what's out there. Um, I'm interviewing now, even though I have a job. I, cause I, cause you also never know what could be next. Um, and so if you, if you have a job and then you get an interview and they say, yes, great. We love you. Come aboard. And you just have to say, Hey, I'm really sorry. Um, thank you for taking a simple email. Thank you for taking the time to interview me. I, uh, at, the, at this time, I don't think it's the right fit for me, but I really look forward to reaching out in the future if things change. Is that kind of, no, that's surprising to me. Again, you're not talking to anyone who's ever had a real job until right now. Um, is that common? Is that like the way the game is played? It is common among millennials. Yep. Uh, is to go and because, yeah, you never know what's going to be out there. I interviewed for a job recently that they were going to offer me $120,000 a year. I didn't get it, but that I like was just like, what? I was like not even anticipating contemplating the job until right. all of a sudden they threw this six figure salary at me. I was like, oh, maybe I will. So right. you never know what's out there, never hurts, and, and interviewing practice is great. And it's also good to just get FaceTime with people. You know, I, I definitely see the value in that. And there's also the idea, I mean, because as, as freelancers, you're always making connections and there's no allegiance. You're always meeting the person who could hire you for the next thing. And I could see that applying to a job job as well, because you don't, what if they don't, what if, you're not available now, but you might be available in six months. And then what if they have a different job? They're interested in you. You know, you weren't good for that one, but you're also, you're good for the $200,000 job or whatever it is, or, you know. Yeah. So it never hurts to get your name out there, your face out there, your, your resume in front of people. Uh, because yeah, they might be like, oh no, she's not good for this job. And then like, yeah, six months later, do that. Like, oh, I like have a person for that. So let me call her. You know, I know I really support that. Yeah. And then I think of the amount of time, like, say, that people are in discussion over something until it actually becomes a real job. Sometimes it's two years or something like that. You know yeah. what I mean? So, no, that is, that is. Uh, and also, don't look bad for the company. There was somebody after you. You right. know, someone next in line. They'll find yeah. a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Do you have another question, Joel? Um, I was wondering uh, which ser job search engine was like your primary one to use? LinkedIn. I was all up on LinkedIn. 
I love LinkedIn because with LinkedIn, it's also a social platform. Um, so say you are applying for a company and this has actually happened since I've been at Original Stitch, we're hiring for a new VP. People have been messaging me and being like, hey, I just saw this, this uh, out of the blue. Like, hey, I just saw this post. I would love to learn more about the position, about how you feel about Original Stitch. We were hiring him for an intern. I had an intern reach out to me who had gone to my university uh, back in Ohio. And he was like, hey, I see that you're uh, a Miami U alum. Uh, I just saw this uh, position open up. Could you pass it along to like whoever's hiring? And I was like, absolutely, I'll pass your, your, your resume along. Um, because it's a social platform as well. Like you're, you're yeah. supposed to, people, you can reach out to people as, as a person. You can become a little bit more personal. Like I, I will have, I will reach out to recruiters of certain companies that I'm looking for that I'm interested in and be like, Hey, I just sent my application in. I'm not sure who to forward it to. Uh, but, but here's my resume again. Like please forward it to whatever, whoever's hiring for this position. That's good. Yeah, that's good advice. This is the most practical, uh, this is the most practical kind of job advice I think I've ever heard in this school, really. No, it's good. It's good. Yeah, LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn. I, I, LinkedIn's massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, Joel, you have anything else? Um, I think that's all. That's good. That's good. The, uh, Monica, do you have anything else? Um, so as, as we're all about to graduate and as we would probably like try to get, get more job as possible and get anything right now because well under this current under this situation, situation it, yeah, yeah it's very, ooh, yeah. okay yeah um i mean you you're still gonna want to like aim for your your niche aim for what you're looking for um, but where do we like sort of draw the draw the line for example i i would love to make money for sure but um i don't want to do for example uh wedding photography or don't do it. i mean if you um, don't want to trust me if you don't want to do it you don't have to do it yeah <laughs> it's, but, like, it's where do you draw the line um <laughs> i know that when i was freelancing and i was i was struggling i was like great i'm gonna become a receptionist until something else takes off um so it is it's it's just like what you're what you're willing to do and and mm -hmm. honestly uh any job could lead to another job um so you never know you never know what if you take if you shoot a wedding and somebody's there and they're like oh i have an event you want to i'm gonna hire you for that and you go to the event and you meet someone and you're like oh like i know here let me take your card and then they'll call you for something else like jobs lead to jobs all the time connections oh yeah oh yeah getting yeah. business business cards guys yeah. Business cards huge vista print amazing you can get 500 like 500 of them for super cheap um i designed my own they have designs i literally have my logo from vista print tattooed on me um this was like, their, like <laughs> this is their like basic like foot camera that i put on my like business card and i loved it so much i got it tattooed on so this is my logo that's insane that is insane you're getting paid for that from vista I, print vista print yeah. This is a paid endorsement right now. In it's fact. getting sponsored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like business cards are huge. Uh, the amount of times people have been like, oh, do you have a card? And I'm, you have to be like, absolutely, I have a card. Here you go. And rather than being like, oh, no, like, can you just add me on Instagram? That's going to take like way longer. Give them a card. You say, my Instagram with all my information on there. Call me if you need me. The old school card. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cards are huge. Cards are massive. I love my, and my, car, my, my cards are like really thick cardboard because the paper little ones, they ripped from people's wallets and my friends ended up using them for joints. Um, so I was like, well, that's not happening anymore. So I got like really, really nice, like cardboard, hard uh, business cards that people actually are like, oh, this is nice. That's got substance to it. What was your point though, Monica? Um, what was your, uh, what was the core of your question though? Like, um, where do we draw the line? I know it's like depending on everyone's you know situation. And um, do would you recommend us to like get a non paid internship just to like get connections and um, like? So um, 
that's super tricky. Um, in California, you're actually not allowed to get an unpaid internship. They have to pay you or give you college credit. Oh, I did yeah. not know that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, no, don't, don't do anything with you. You're not getting paid. Absolutely not. Connections are great. Okay. But you can make connections anywhere. Like money is money. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I was offered two days ago. And is it a good were, company? Um, it's, it's a friend of a friend and they had a non-paid internship where I was supposed to like connect with um, some artists and sort of like email them about um, something that they're working on. Just like sort of just connecting with all the artists okay. and they're like, no. <laughs> you should never do anything for free. Like okay. your, your, time is, your time is money. Mm -hmm. um, that was like one of the really cool things that I learned working at Airbnb is I know exactly how much an hour of my time is worth. I know exactly mm -hmm. how much it is. Um, so now when I, when people are like, oh, like, can you do a job? I'm like, I can know exactly how much I should be getting paid mm -hmm. for, this, for this job. For that, that's an easily a $20 an hour gig to email people. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. never do anything for free. Because <laughs> then you'll always, like, people will just begin to, kind of like our photography. People will then, again, begin to assume, well, you can always do it for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think of, no, that is a good question, though, because I think that students are oftentimes offered opportunities to do things for free. And I'm trying to think of, of ones that I would consider beneficial, you know what I mean? Because I don't, I am, like, I've never had an unpaid intern myself, you know what I mean? I always feel that photographers need to get paid, like, anyone else needs to get paid. Like you never see like an engineer having an unpaid inter internship, you know? And so it feels exploitative, but I'm trying to think of things that I would think would be. Um, generally one-off gigs. So like I worked a festival for free because they got me into the festival and I got to be in the press kit and I got to meet all the artists. So I was like, great, I don't need to get paid for this. This is awesome, I'm happy to do this. Um, I did, I had an unpaid internship with, uh, a clothing company, the two bandits. Uh, I got, I got a uh, college credit. I got a credit for a class doing that. Um, so just make sure that if you are going to do something for free, it's, it's somehow benefiting you. Cause if you're just wasting your time doing something for somebody else, it's like, why your time is precious. Your time is valuable. Um, don't, don't waste it. <laughs> Well, how do you feel about low paid jobs though? Because I think of say my own experience in photography, my early jobs, like I remember I worked at a newspaper where I got paid $35 a photo and it was like shot on black and white processing, <laughs> you know, going out to do the shoot, processing film in my parents' basement, you know, doing the prints, then driving them <laughs> to, the, to the newspaper, you know, and I, 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 this was a while ago, but that did begin a career for me that I, that blossomed into a real career, you know? And so what is your take on things that are not money-making? Low paying. Uh, that pay, but are low paying. Yeah. Uh, so long as they're getting paid, that's fine because you are also probably gaining an immense amount of experience, um, which is also huge. Your degree will take you fairly far, but once you graduate and get your first job, Nobody's, nobody cares that you have a degree. You have your first job. Um, oh, so you, true. Yeah, you get your first job and then that's what they're looking at from then on. Pretty much they'll just assume you have one. We'll just assume you have a degree. Um, so landing that first job is, is big and you just kind of want to get that because the experience that you'll gain from that job will then lead into other jobs. Um, and it's, experience is a huge reward um, especially if it's a low paying job, you have to be like, great, what am I going to learn from this? I took a, I took a low paying photo editing job, uh, from my second year of grad school. Um, and I hated it, but I, it got me on set. Um, I learned how to retouch skin. I like gave me all of these like really, really important skills that I then ended up using throughout my life and throughout my career. So I think low paying job is fine. So long as you know that you're going to get something out of this. Like I took a pay cut from, to go from Airbnb to original stitch 
because I knew that I was going to be learning a brand new skill set. And that's really what I wanted to get out of it. No, yeah, I think that's well stated. Because I do think in the beginning, um, I think low paying jobs are the key to, yeah, learning how to do what is out there, learning how to do what you don't want to do. It allows you into that world and the stakes aren't that high. So you can kind of figure these things out. I think, I think you made a good point with the stakes not being high. Like I remember my first time on a photo set. Uh, I was I was working uh, under a photographer for Teen Vogue. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever been on a set. Uh, it was, this was before I decided to get a degree in photography. I wore brown boots, uh, a cute top. I had like a cute scarf. My like hair and makeup was done. Um, I kept getting in the way. I didn't even know what a C stand was. Like, could you imagine if they had been like paying me lots of money? Like, no. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I was there literally just, and like, it, it was one of those, I, I worked, I worked on this photographer for two weeks, wasn't paid, but I was like, I am going to learn everything. I'm, I'm on Teen Vogue shoots. Like, okay, did you, I'll be happy to pay. Yeah. yeah but I like, they, they shouldn't have That's paid. Good. I didn't know what I was, I didn't know what a C-stand was. I got in the way of the client. Like, <laughs> they would have fired me if they could. Yeah. yeah. These things happen. The, uh, you know, here's a question that came up when you were a student. Now, you are an extrovert. Can we agree? What? Yes. Me? What? <laughs> yes. What does I, one do? Yeah. How does one open these doors and how does one navigate if they're, if they're not an extrovert? Um, so I don't believe that confidence is only reserved for extroverts. Um, if you have confidence in yourself and in your work, and you have the ability to speak succinctly on those points, um, that's really, really gonna help you moving forward in the interview process and, and in, in generally in life, like just having that confidence and believing in yourself because that will come out regardless of if you want it to or not. If you have the confidence, um, it will come out any which way it wants to. Yeah, I agree. And I am a big supporter of like, you know, there are people who, photographers or other contemporaries who only hire, you know, other loud voices to be with them. And then those who also don't want that at all. And they only want some like Zen master on set with them. And I'm thinking of in terms of, a, you know, commercial photographer and assistant, but in terms of, yeah, an office dynamic or any of these things, I am a believer that there is room for everyone. And I think, you know, your, your point about um, extrovert is, well taken or confidence is well taken like don't confuse extrovertism with confidence yeah or just don't because I'm loud and i'm like the loudest person doesn't necessarily mean i know what i'm talking about but if you speak like you do know what you're talking about people tend to believe that if that you do um that happens a lot <laughs> but i had i i were i talked my way into this current job I had a friend help me make a, make a slide presentation and I talked my way into the job I have because I said everything with confidence. Like I totally knew what I was talking about. I had no idea what I was talking about, but I said it with confidence and I got a job. Do you think you faked it till you made it? A hundred percent. Yeah. Do it. Really a hundred percent? Or would you say, I mean, let's really evaluate it. Or would you say you faked 60%? I faked my knowledge. I, I blurred the truth a little bit about how great I was at social media. I had influencer relations four years ago. I, cause I set up my influencer relations and I just kept them. That was set up four years ago. Not right now. Um, right. But I also knew enough about the subject to say, Hey, and it was, it was pretty simple. It was, hey, here's, a, here's one of your Instagram posts. You haven't posted in two weeks. There are comments on these posts. Why isn't anybody responding to them? Okay, this is how we raise engagement because these are very simple things that I could see that needed to be fixed. And I said, this is what you gotta do, fix these. And they're like, oh. So you feel the bar was low to some degree. Like they were really clueless and probably hadn't even had a social media person. When I had a social media person, she just was very good. 
Um, but it was, it was coming in and being knowledgeable about what were already some issues um, just by doing a little bit of research. And by doing that little bit of research, I was like, oh, I know, I know what's going on and now I know how to kind of fix it for you. I'm not gonna tell you how to fix it until you hire me. Um, but it was, yeah, it, was, it was doing a little bit of research, understanding what the company was, um, and then coming in and being like, hi, I know what I'm talking about, kind of. Interesting, interesting. Uh, probably with every job, there's the, the enthusiasm for something carries the knowledge that the person truly has, you know. And I mean, now I'm, and like I said, like this, I came here to learn and um, I've learned so much just in the, in the five months, six months I've been here. That's great. Starting to great. enable me to continue forward. Right. Right. That's exciting. I'm glad your company's still around too. You know what I mean? Like. Yep. For now. Yeah. Well, that's everything. That's yeah. what everybody says about everything, whether you work at a big company or a small company or Amazon or, you know what I mean? Like anything. Yeah. Airbnb, that one was a tough one. That was a, that was a tough one to, to watch. Oh, why? Um, so what they didn't actually say in the news was two weeks prior, uh, they let go of all of their contract workers. Um, so that was my entire team. Those were all of my friends. Those were all of the interior designers. Um, and then a couple of days ago, they finally let go of 25% of their full-time staff. Um, so that was it, was, it was, it was sucky to see like the contractors didn't get any recognition, but um, yeah, having a lot of, a lot of my friends uh, are now do not have jobs, which, which really sucks. That's hard. Yeah. That's yeah, hard. And, it, and it's a huge dynamic shift where um, most of my friends are having to leave the city because they can't afford it. Yeah. Oh, that's hard. My, my, my best friend who is an interior designer at Airbnb, when she got the news, she hopped on a plane, came back, packed up her stuff, and she moved last week. Oh, really? It's like immediate. Immediate. This has happened before in San Francisco um, in 2008, um, where people were suddenly moving back, you know, to the parents' house. Um, wow. The, um, you know, you have been great. Uh, you've been great. And, you know, I thank you for coming back, too, because I feel like the last time I had you here, I wanted it to transpire like this, but I didn't know the right questions to ask you. And I think having a second shot at it, this is what I wanted, really, which was like where we could really get the nitty gritty and all these details about finding a job and that LinkedIn stuff was priceless. Oh, yeah, right? Google, Google it, watch some YouTube, set, set up your LinkedIn. It's huge. It is the best place to find a job and connect with other creatives. So that is international, correct? Absolutely. Yep. That's great. Yeah, the, I think we're ready to let you go, but let's see, does anyone else have any questions? And um, this, Dig deep. Don is very willing to ask questions. Um, um, say, say you were on the job and you find yourself doing more than close. Uh, would you propose like a higher pay? Um, so that's going to happen a lot, surprisingly enough. Um, but once you, everything should be in a contract. So everything should be laid out and detailed. Um, if you find that you are doing or have been asked to do something that is not specified in your contract, you can say contract negotiation, renegotiation, if that's something they want. Could you say that again, Joel? I don't think I grasped that totally. Um, if you're asked to do more than was on, what was on the contract, would you like try to propose a higher pay? Oh, you I, mean, if, oh, okay, suddenly you're being like the full-time photographer in addition to social media or something like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, if they ask you to do like additional other work that um, wasn't on the contract, how would you like propose a higher pay? If we're, or would you? Um, so it, it, there's two different things. If we're, if we're talking like on-set gig, like you're working on, they ask you to do videography on top of it, then absolutely a contract renegotiation. If you have a full-time position, um, a lot of the times you will be asked to wear multiple hats and that is just kind of expected. Um, I will say that we, if, you have, if you're in like a nine to five job, you get evaluated every three months and that's when you're like, hey, I have been doing X, Y, and Z extra. I would like to get paid X, Y, and Z more 
for this or I really don't feel comfortable doing this anymore. Please give the job to somebody else. Um, but a lot of the times you, if you're working a nine to five, especially if you're working a startup, you're like, yep, give, you need to be a creative recruiter. I'll be a creative recruiter. You need a, a specialist. You need someone to talk to the influencers. I got it. I totally got this for you. Um, <laughs> a lot of it till you make it on the exhibit right here. Absolutely. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm doing it. Um, and I'm, I, because the thing is, if you fail, there's pretty much a chance that nobody's going to notice unless you like really, really screw up. And it's a great chance to just learn something new. Um, I'm learning how to campaign ideation with, with influencers, uh, how to work and, 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 and work with the campaign from beginning to end using influencer marketing. Um, I've never done this before. I am doing it now. I haven't screwed up yet. <laughs> Next, we're going to have your boss in here and ask if they have oh, seen through the fake it till you make it. My manager, her and I have wine about this all the time. Oh really? Oh yeah. Oh, we're both we're both in the same boat. She's 28 and she's managing a team of three of us, and she's like, I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm like, it's okay, me neither. Oh, so it's all young people. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, we're all we're all under 35. Right. How old are you? Can I ask? 27. You're 27. 27. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, yeah. No, I guys just heads up. <laughs> wait, 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 what did you say? It all goes downhill after 28. You think? I don't know. I think it gets better after 50. Um, <laughs> the, uh, does anyone else have any questions? No, you guys got it? Um, Don, this was a blast. This yeah. was a blast. Uh, thank you so much. And this is going to be recorded. Um, the and fake, then, uh, if once you feel free to reach out on my Instagram, Don Elizabeth Photo, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn if you need some help with that. Um, I'm available anytime. That's great. We will let you go and then class, let's take, let's take a break now and come back in 15 minutes and then we'll just catch up on other things, okay?